Amen. Keep your place in Acts chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. So Acts chapter 8 is a unique chapter in Acts. It has three different stories um, in um, Acts chapter 8. So we're going to take three weeks to get through Acts chapter 8 because I want to make sure um, that we look very closely at each of these stories. We have the story of, of Saul and kind of the ending of, of uh, Stephen's execution. Then we have the story of Simon the sorcerer. And then we have the very famous story of uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuchs. We're going to look at each one of those stories individually to make sure that we don't um, breeze over anything in the Bible. I really like that story of Simon the sorcerer. Um, there's a lot of interesting things that we can learn um, from that. But tonight we're going to look at the first three verses of Acts chapter 8. So let's look down at our Bibles and look at the first three verses of Acts chapter 8. The Bible says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. So we just had the death of Stephen. We just went through Stephen's sermon um, last week. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad through the regions of Judea and, Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They stayed in Jerusalem. And the devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So here we see this story of, you know, this man called Saul. So Saul will later in Acts chapter 9, um, he will get saved and he will um, become, God will rename him Paul. And of course he is um, Paul, you know, what many people would consider um, the greatest evangelist who's ever lived. Paul um, actually penned through, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit. He penned most of the New Testament that we read. Okay, he didn't write uh, the book of Acts. Most people believe that Luke um, uh, wrote the book of Acts, and uh, you know, I'm along those lines as well. But Paul um, became um, a great Christian and somebody who accomplished great things um, for Christ in his life. So tonight, I want to give you two reasons why Paul was able to accomplish so much in his life. I want to give you two reasons why Paul was such a great Christian in his life. All right, and you say, uh, okay, that's great, but that's a little depressing if I see this guy that's just so great. But here's the thing. I'm going to give you two of these reasons, and these two reasons can be anyone in this room. Anyone in this room, as we look at Paul this evening, this could be you. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter um, your, your background, any of that. This could be you. So we'll look at these two reasons that Paul was such a great Christian. I shouldn't even say, like, why Paul was great, because we shouldn't be sitting in our chairs, um, in our, in our you know, chairs listening to a sermon saying, I want to be great in my life. But we should be thinking, like, I would like to accomplish great things for the Lord in my life. We should be thinking that way. And I'm telling you that you can. So this is going to be kind of a, a motivational, um, educational sermon for you this evening, but it's really up to you, you know, what you do with your life. So let's look at these two things. Um, about Paul, and then let's look at how we could apply those two things um, to ourselves this evening. So look down at Acts chapter um, 8 and verse number 3 for a minute. So he's now, he's called Saul. He's not saved. He's actually a Pharisee who is actually persecuting the church. He's, he was at the, um, look at verse number 3. It says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, meaning it's him doing it. He's leading the charge here, entering into every house, and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Turn to Acts chapter 9 and verse number 1. I don't want to, you know, study through Acts chapter 9, but I do want to show you a pattern in this man's life um, as we look at these two things this evening. Look at Acts chapter 9 and verse number 1. Still Saul, not saved, still a Pharisee. Look what it says. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter, against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, what does that mean? If he found any Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Paul, this is the first thing I want to show you about Paul, why he was so successful as a Christian, and why he was able to accomplish so much for the Lord in his life. Paul was driven Paul was driven. Paul was driven before he was saved. He was a driven man. This is Paul in Acts chapter 9. He is going out of his way to go and get more permission, 
to persecute more people. You say, yeah, but it's wicked things. But look, he was a driven person is all I'm trying to get you to understand. He's not saved here. And when he was persecuting the church of God, he was driven in that task. The Bible shows us this. As an unsaved man, he was driven. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 now. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I believe, personally, I believe that this is one of the reasons that God chose Paul right here. Because he was just a driven person. And you know what? God was like, I, I can use that. I can use that for the kingdom of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 21. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 21. Paul says this. Paul's writing this letter. This is his second letter to the Corinthian church. He says, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seeds of Abraham? So am I. Are they the ministers of Christ? He says, I speak as a fool. He says, I am more. Now, who could say this next statement right here? Look what he says. He's saying, he's saying, he's like, I am working harder than everybody is what he says here. He says, in labors more abundant. He's saying, nobody is working for Christ harder than me. I mean, that's pretty bold to come out and say, he's basically coming out and saying, I can outwork anybody is what Paul is saying here. That, I mean, that's a bold statement. And then he says, you know, in persecutions, he goes into this persecution like nobody's been persecuted more than me. He says, in stripes above measure. That means stripes like stripes across your back from being whipped. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers. And he's like, even when I'm not getting beaten up, even when I'm not getting thrown in prison, he's like, I'm in constant danger, is what he's saying here. He's like, I am in constant threat of being robbed, killed, whatever, drowned, in perils by my own countrymen. He's like, even my own, even the, the Jews are after me. You know, he's saying, even my own people are after me. In perils, in perils by the heathen, the Gentiles are after me. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. It's like, even my friends. <laughs> he's like, even my friends are after me, he says. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Look, I mean... The guy is saying, like, nobody's going harder than me. And, I mean, he's basically, you know, telling people, he's like, nobody's going through more than me. He's trying to be an example to weak believers. He's trying to be an example to people who are like, I don't know if I can do this. Because he's like, he's just like never stopping. He's so driven, even through all of this, he will never stop. So nobody could say, like, hey, this is too hard with Paul around. Nobody could say, oh, you know what? Uh, my friends are backstabbing me. I can't do this anymore. Nobody can say that with this guy around. Because he's like, I, I work harder than everybody. He's like, I'm in more danger than everybody. He's like, I've gone through more garbage than everybody. And he's like, even when I'm not going through garbage, I'm in constant fear and threatening of going through garbage, is what he's saying. So look, I mean, here's the thing. Being a driven person, Paul was... He was probably a naturally driven person. You will find that some people are naturally driven. Okay, look, some people are, 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 are stronger than others in their arms and their legs. Some people can naturally run further than other people. Some people can naturally, you know, lift more than other people. But here's what I'm trying to get you to understand tonight, and I'm going to explain at the end of the sermon. Anybody can be a driven person. Anybody. It's something that can be learned. It may come naturally to other people. It, come, it may come naturally to some people, but I'm telling you, it's something that anyone can become. And Paul was extremely driven in his life. What's the next thing? Turn to Luke chapter 7. So that's the first thing. Paul was driven. As an unsaved man, he was driven persecuting the church. As a saved man, he was driven for Christ. 
God was able to harness that power. And anybody can be driven. We'll talk about that at the end of the sermon. It may come natural to others, but that's with anything, folks. That's with anything. I mean, some people may have a, you know, a propensity or, or you, know, a, 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 you know, a tendency towards sin that they grew up around or something like that that other people just don't struggle with at all. It works for the good and it works for the bad. But anyone, any saved person can get sin out of their life and any saved person can become a driven person. Right? That's the beauty of being a Christian. The Bible says that there's nothing that we can't overcome. Here's the second thing. Look at Luke chapter 7. So the first thing, the first thing that made Paul such a successful Christian was he was driven. Here's the second thing. The second thing is this. He was a sinner. You're like, what? You're like, what? He was, he was there at the slaying of Stephen. He was there. And look, I don't know if he was in charge of the whole thing, but he was certainly part of the leadership that made that happen. He was a great sinner. And you say, how could that possibly benefit him when he got saved and then going forward in his Christian life. Well, I'm going to show you. Look at Luke chapter 7 and look at verse number 37. Look at Luke chapter 7 and verse number 37. Let's look at what the Bible says here. So Paul, Paul was a sinner. I mean, we're all sinners, but I mean, he was a, he was a great sinner. He was doing some very bad sins in his life before he got saved. Look at Luke chapter 7. And look, many people will think that in their lives. This is a stumbling block for most people. Most people will say, I've messed up the last 30 years, the last 40 years, the last 50 years of my, whatever, put it, enter a number. They'll say, I've been so bad, I've messed up so many things in my life. It's like, there's no way I can do anything great for God. Let's look at what the Bible actually says about that. Look at Luke chapter 7 and verse number 37. The Bible says, and behold, a woman in the city, which was what? A sinner. Now look, everybody's a sinner, but when it says this, what it's saying is like, she's in sin. She's you know, she's a harlot, or she's, you know, a pro, you know, she's a prostitute, or she's, she's someone that's not, like, seen as a righteous person. She's not living a righteous life, okay? Which is a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house. <coughs> Excuse me. She brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping. This is this woman. And began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, pff, pff. it's like if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. What he's saying is, this is, a, this is an unrighteous person. She's, a, she's in sin. And Jesus answered him, saying, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. He saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, one, owned five, one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? So he says there's two debtors. One owes 500 and the other owes a tenth of that, 50. So somebody owes, you know, $100,000 and somebody owes $10,000. And then this man just forgives both of them. Okay, and he says, Simon, and, and he said, when they had nothing to pay, he forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, verse 42, which of them will love him the most? A little different when we think about it this way, isn't it? Look at verse 43. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Here's what Jesus was saying. He's saying that the sinner, this woman who's been in sin, and you can already see it before she even gets to Jesus. She's, she's completely humble before him. She's washing you know, his feet. She's anointing him. And look, what he's saying is people that have been forgiven much will be much more thankful towards the person that forgave them. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's why Jesus... That's why Jesus, you know, said, I'm here to, you know, I'm here for the sinners. Go to Mark chapter, oh, you, you're in um, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1, look at verse 15. Paul knew this. Paul knew this throughout his whole life. Paul knew this. He says, this is a faithful saying. 
and worthy of all exception, he says, that Christ came into the world to save sinners. And then look at the last five words. He says, of whom I am chief. I mean, it would just be kind of a common saying that, Jesus, that Christ came into the world to save sinners until he says, of whom I am chief. He says, Christ came to save sinners. Yes, all, we all have sinned. But he said, I was the worst. So, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is talking about how he's working harder, how he'll never stop, how he'll never quit, how he's just loyal to Christ, how he'll never stop. He works, he's in labors more than anybody else. He's in perils more than anybody else. And he will never stop. And all that time, he says, I'm also, I was the chiefest of sinners. I was the, of all sinners, I was the worst, he says. You see a pattern here? You see a pattern here? Go to Mark chapter 2 and look at verse number 16. Go to Mark chapter 2 and look at verse number 16. This is a key for the Christian right here. Please do not miss this point. Please do not miss this point. This is a key for the Christian. Paul knew he was the chiefest of sinners. He's giving pastoral advice in Timothy. These are the, the pastoral epistles, the tea books in your Bible. He's giving pastoral advice, and he's saying to this young man who's going to be a pastor, he's like, I was the chiefest sinner. Well, shouldn't he be saying, I mean, wouldn't we think he would be saying to Timothy, like, listen, you need to be like me. I'm the greatest. Listen, listen, kid. You need to listen to me because I know these scriptures. I talked to Jesus taught me these scriptures himself. Wouldn't, I mean, instead he's, he's saying to this kid, this young man who wants to go into the ministry, he's just like, I was the chiefest of sinners. Look at Mark chapter 2 and verse number 16. The Bible says, When the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with the publicans and sinners, again, they said, in, in the, they said unto his disciples, How is it when he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the phys physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here's the thing, folks. What does that mean? What does that mean? Here's what it means. Prideful people will never get saved. That's the first thing you need to understand. Prideful people will never get saved. Why? Because they're prideful. They'll never come to what? They'll never come to repentance. That, that just means they will never decide to change their mind that they need to be saved, that they're a sinner that needs to be saved. They'll just think that they're great. The first thing you need to understand to be saved is that you're a sinner and that you need to be saved, that you're on your way to hell otherwise. Prideful people will never get saved. You're like, well, we're, we're all saved. Okay, well, here's another thing. Go to Jeremiah chapter 9. The Bible says... You know, <laughs> pride will destroy you, my friends. Prideful Christians will ruin their lives. Go to Jeremiah chapter 9, Jeremiah chapter 9, and look at verse number 23. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Before a fall. The Bible says that pride will destroy you. Even Christians. Let me ask you something. When Paul said to Timothy that I was the chiefest of sinners, was that prideful? No. That was humble. That was humility is what Paul was showing there. Look at Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse number 23. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse number 23. This is what we have to be careful about in our Christian lives right here. Because as you get in your Christian life and you start reading the Bible and you start, look, if you start reading the Bible, you start getting in church, you start soul winning, you start listening to Bible preaching, you start learning what this book actually has for your life, it's not going to take you too long to like rocket ahead of most normal people, especially people that are not saved. You're going to start looking at the world, seeing, seeing things like, this is crazy, like, why don't people, why are people so foolish? But here's the thing, look at verse number 23 of Jeremiah chapter 9. It says, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. So it doesn't say don't be wise. It doesn't say don't be wise. It doesn't say don't know the Bible. It says don't glory in it. Don't glory in the fact that, like, don't be like this person that, you know, you learn the Bible, you, you know how to give the gospel, you know how to get to heaven, and you go to work and you're like, eh, idiots. 
You go to work and you're just like, you're just like shoving it down people's throat and you know, people are, are like, whoa, you know, and they don't want to hear it and you're just like, you know, you're just like morons, foolish people, you know, all this. I mean, don't, that, that, you're a prideful person. You're glorying in your wisdom, the Bible says. Look at, uh, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. It doesn't say he's, you're not to be mighty. It says don't glory in your might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. It doesn't say, you know, it's, it's inherently wrong to have a dollar in your pocket. What's wrong is when you have a dollar in your pocket and you're like, ha, you think you're better than everybody because you got a dollar in your pocket. It's like, don't glory in these things. Paul didn't glory in those things. He's like, I'm the chiefest sinner. He was humble. But let him that glorieth in this, that he understand and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth for these things, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Look, he was a sinner. That's why he was great. Because he knew that he was a sinner. Prideful Christians... Prideful Christians will do nothing in their Christian life. Nothing. That's the opposite of Paul. They will accomplish nothing. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. Look, you have to watch constantly in your Christian life for pride. You need to be watching for that animal to creep into your life, you need to be guarding yourself and you need to be guarding your family against pride. Please listen to me about this. It will destroy any Christian. It will destroy any Christian's family. Then cometh shame, destruction. Like the Bible's not like messing around when it talks about what will happen to a prideful person. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible, I mean, God tries to keep us humble. God even did some things in Paul's life to keep him humble. I mean, Paul was the greatest. We can look at that and say, Paul did great things for the Lord. He was the greatest evangelist. But God did things to keep him humble. Why? Because he didn't want Paul to become worthless. He didn't want Paul to fall into shame. He didn't want Paul to fall into destruction. He was protecting Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look what the Bible says here. This is what Paul says right here in the very next chapter. He says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. You know that, that Jesus Christ himself taught Paul for three years. That's, I mean, you say, where did Paul get all of his knowledge? He got it from Jesus. He got it from Jesus. I mean, if Jesus pulled you aside for a few years and decided, you know, you're my pupil now and I'm just going to teach you extra things because I've chosen you and I'm going to teach you these things so you can teach the world these things. I mean, do you think you could stay humble through that? You think you would get a little puffed up about that? Like, Jesus chose me. But look what it says here. It says, that I, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul say, is saying, in case I would start to think too highly of myself, is what he's saying. Through the abundance of the revelations, because God has given me so much, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the measure of the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, I don't know what this is. It's some kind of health issue or, or pain that he has. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. It's something, that, something in his body that hurts him, okay, in his flesh. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He's saying, I asked God three times to take this away from me. He's, and you know what God said? God said, no. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect. Don't, don't miss this. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You say, I can't do anything great for God because I'm not like Superman. God doesn't use Superman. God doesn't use, you know, Dwayne Johnson or whatever it is, you know? He doesn't use the rock. He doesn't use these powerful people. You know why? Because God wants, God wants people to know that it was him that did it. God wants people to know that he, the victory was his. That's why he said to Gideon, Gideon went to battle with all these men. He's like, no, that's too many. He's like, no, that's too many. No, that's too many. 
And so Gideon only had 300 men. It's like 300 people because God wanted to know, wanted everyone to know that it was him that won the battle. Not, not the men. He says, my grace. God says, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Mostly, therefore, I, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He's like, it's worth it. He's like, it's worth it. He's like, you know what? I mean, this guy is, this guy is so great. This guy is so great. God literally said, I'm not taking away your pain. He's like, God said, I'm not taking away your pain so you can keep doing the great things that you're doing. And Paul says, if there was a risk that if you took away the pain that I would not be able to do, he's like, no. He's like, he's like I want the power of Christ on me. I don't care what physical pain it costs me, which in the previous chapter we already saw that, all the, all the horrible tribulation that he's going through, the people trying to kill him, trying to hurt him, actually hurting him, actually almost killing him. He says, whatever it takes that the power of Christ sits on me. God says to him, he's like, no, he's like, I'm not going to give you what you want because it will take you in a direction I don't want you going. And Paul's just like, I'm good with that. He's like, thank God. He says, therefore, and not only that, He's thankful for the thorn in the flesh. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities. Let me tell you something. This is easier said than done right here. Let me tell you something. You know, these guys, these apostles, when they're, you know, as we saw in a couple chapters earlier, they were persecuted and they were just joining in persecution. Let me tell you something. I would love to say that that's just an easy thing to do. It's not. I mean, when you're getting persecuted, it kind of stinks. But look at, look, at how, look at how much faith he has, where he just says, I take pleasure in this. I take pleasure in all the bad things that happen to me in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. So look, everybody's against this guy, even his own friends. And he's just saying, I just glory in all of it. He's like, even this health issue that I had that God said I'm not going to take away, he's like, hey, if that means the power of Christ is still going to rest on me and I can still do great things for the kingdom of God, he's like, thank God for this thorn in the flesh. Because, because he stayed humble and because he recognized that he, because he stayed humble, he always remembered, let me bring it back to the point, that he was the chiefest of sinners. And that's why he was able to do great things for Christ. Pride will destroy you as a Christian. You must stay humble. But if you say in your life, oh, you know, I've had so much sin in my past. You know, I've, I've just wrecked so many years in my life. No, Paul was the chief. You have no excuse. You have no excuse in your life for blaming past sins, for doing nothing going forward. Amen. Use it. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. You say, now, okay, I get it. So what is it? He was driven, he was driven, and he was a chief sinner. Those are the two things that Paul used in his life to do great things for the kingdom of God on earth. You say, yeah, what about me? Let's talk about you now. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. You say, I'm not really a driven person. I have a bad past. And look, I'm not, I'm not pointing anybody out. I'm just saying, like, anybody could say this in their lives. They could say, I've done things in my past. I'm just, I'm just not driven. Look, that's an excuse because you can be. You can be a driven person. Look at David's mighty men in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Let's just look at a couple examples of these 37 men that are listed in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Um, just tell me if you think these men sound like they're driven. If these men sound like, you know, they are the type of men that could accomplish great things in their life. Look at verse number 8. I'll just give you a couple examples. These be the names of the mighty men who David had, the Tachamite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, the Esnite, he lift up his spear against 800 who he slew at one time. This man in one battle killed 800 men with his spear. That's pretty impressive. I mean, I can't even imagine. I, I used to wrestle. Like, I wrestled from second grade until I graduated high school. 
and I don't know how many matches I wrestled in my, in my life, but it was a lot. And we would wrestle for six minutes, like three two-minute periods. And by the time you were done with that six minutes, you, I, you were done. I mean, you were done, like you had nothing left. Can you imagine going into battle and, and, and having 800 individual matchups in one day? That's a mighty man right there. That's a huge accomplishment. Look at verse 14. And David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, so here the Philistines had overrun Bethlehem. And David longed and said, oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Here the Philistines had overrun this city, and they had control of this well. And he's just longing for when they had control back of this city. He's like, oh, man, if I could just drink out of the well. You know what he's saying? I wish the Philistines weren't there. I wish they hadn't overrun that gate. But look at what he says that, and look what three men do. And three mighty men break through the host of the Phil Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. <laughs> I mean, here the king's just, he's lamenting over the fact that the Philistines have taken this city. He's like, oh, that we, I could just, what he's saying is I wish I had the city back. What he's saying is I wish the Philistines wouldn't be there. I wish they wouldn't be stronger than us right now to have this city of Bethlehem. He's like, I wish that wouldn't have happened. I wish we could push them out. Three men go through the entire army themselves. They get a drink of water and they bring it to the king. Here you go. I mean, that, that's, that, that's mighty men right there. Those are brave men. And then David, nevertheless, would he not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. He gives the, he gives the glory to, the, to God. Right? He doesn't say, you guys are so great and so strong. He just gives glory to the Lord. Look at verse 18. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief among three. And he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them and had the name among three. Look down at verse number 20. Benaiah. I like Benaiah. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian, it's even, you, know, you say, okay, he just slew one man. But here's the thing, look what he did. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. He went down to him with a staff. He took the spear out, I mean, he killed him with his own spear. And plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. Now that's impressive. It's like, you got to go and you got to fight that guy and you got to kill that guy. You're like, okay, I'm pretty sure I can beat that guy. No, you got to do it with his own spear. Like, oh, that's different. You say, okay, these are mighty men. You say, these are mighty men. You know, where, but where did they come from? Did they, were they born mighty? Were they like, you know, were they like baby John in the hospital and then they just grew up and they just became mighty? You know, they just, I mean, they were just, they're just really good at fighting. They're just really loyal. They just grew up, they were just really loyal people. They're just really good servants of King David. No, I'll show you where they came from. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 22. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 22. David in his worst moment, he's running. He's running away from Saul for his life. Years before, years before any of this happened. He's running for his life. He's at his lowest point. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 22 and look at verse number 1. David is running for his life here. There's never a lower point. Well, maybe one. But there's, this is a pretty low point in David's life. But look at verse number one. It says, David therefore departed thence and escaped. He's trying to get away from being killed. And escaped to the cave Adalam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone, but look, people followed him. And everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there were with him about four... This wasn't the women and children here. There were with him about 400 men. David created the mighty men out of this batch of losers. These were people, they had nothing. They were discontented. That means they weren't happy with anything that was going on. They were in debt. They were, I mean, they weren't successful people here. 
These people, they didn't make good decisions. They were in distress. People didn't like them. These, these people, I mean, by all, by all intents and purposes, these people were losers. <laughs> I mean, if you read this, David turned them into mighty men. They became David's mighty men out of this batch of 400. But here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Anyone can become a mighty man for the Lord or a mighty woman for the Lord. Anyone. Why? For the same reasons as Paul. For the same reasons as the mighty men. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Look what the Bible says here. I mean, look, you say, I'm just, I'm just not driven. You know, I'm just not a driven person. You say, I am not strong. I'm not driven. But look what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse number 10. It says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, it says, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You know what it's saying? It's saying, whatever you, can, whatever you have to do on this earth when you're alive, he's like, you do it as hard as you can possibly do it. That's what Paul was doing. That, when we see Paul, when we see Saul on the scene in Acts chapter 8, that's what he's doing. He's, doing, he's being a Pharisee with all his might. He's going at this job that he has with all his might. And it's funny because God actually uses weak people. If you look at the story in Judges chapter 11, um, read it when you get home. I mean, the Bible says that, you know, the Lord said unto Gideon, it says, they that are with thee are too many for me, he says, over and over again. Because God wanted Gideon to know that it was him that won the battle. It was the Lord that won the battle, not the people. He uses weak people throughout the Bible all the time. All the time. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Actually, turn to Philippians chapter 3. But Philippians chapter 4, 13 says, you say, but I'm not strong. But guess what? The Bible says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Look, we're not talking about, we're not talking about, you don't have to kill 800 people with a sword, or with a spear, folks. We're fighting a spiritual battle here as Christians. You know, we're not in a physical battle. But look, you have to have the same type of fortitude. You have to have the same type of strength. You know, you have to have strength in your life, but you can do all those things through Christ. The Bible says, look at Philippians chapter 3. I mean, so the first thing, look, the first thing is this. Like, the first thing that you needed to do to, like, you know, obviously you need to be saved to do great things for Christ in your life, right? You need to have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to have trusted on Jesus Christ alone and been sealed by the Holy Spirit. What's that mean? You've let go of any belief in yourself, any belief that you have to work your way to heaven, any belief that you can be good enough to get to heaven. All you deserve is hell. All you've done is sin against the Lord. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved in a moment. You're saved forever. The first, I mean, look, if you're not saved today, you need to talk to somebody after church. But the first thing that you need to do to do great things for Christ in your life is just is be saved. But the second thing is this. Philippians chapter 3 says, Brethren, I count myself not, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And then look what he says. Here's that drive again. He says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Look, you got to work hard in the right direction is, is what he's saying. Paul was driven for Christ just as much as he was driven against him. He was a driven person. But here's the thing. Here's the secret. I mean, being, being a driven person is, is a sermon series in itself. But being a driven person, it means like, I mean, what's he doing? It says, I press toward the mark, right? He's constantly, you got to think about this for a second. To be a driven person, you say, I'm not driven. Here's your problem. Think about, think about in, uh, what, what was the, the verse? Think about in Acts chapter 1 and verse uh, 10 or 11 where the angel looks at the men and says, you know, why ye stand ye gazing up to heaven? Jesus was, just, Jesus was just ascended into heaven, and they're all just standing there. You better start pressing. So here's the first thing you need to understand about being driven. You quit standing around. You're like, I want to be driven at work. Don't stand around. Like, I'm not, I don't have anything to do right now. Find something to do. This is what driven people do. This is what, you're like, there's this guy that I work with. He's super driven. That's what he does. 
He's never standing around. He's always like, I've done this task. He's looking for something else to do. And look, you may go up and be this annoying guy that just started a job and goes up to the boss and he's like, what do I do next? Or what do I do next? Or what do I do next? But pretty soon, if you keep doing that long enough, you're going to know what comes next. You're going to learn what to do next. You won't have to ask anymore. And guess what? Then you're just going to be, because they're going to be like, oh, this kid's motivated at least. They'll, they'll appreciate that today. Don't get me wrong. I mean, believe me. But pretty soon you're going to figure out because you're being driven, because you're motivated, you're going to figure out what comes next, and then you're a driven person. It's learned behavior is what I'm trying to get you to understand. It's learned behavior. It's, I mean, reading a book isn't going to make you this way. Reading some self-help book isn't going to make you a driven person. I'm sorry. It's not standing around. The Bible's telling us, the angel's like, why are you standing there? What's Paul say he's doing? He's like, I'm pressing. I'm constantly pressing. So what happens when you're pressing on something? What happens when I press on something? I just wrecked a hymnal. What happens when I press on something and it falls over? I go find something else to press on. You just keep pressing on things and pressing and pressing and pressing. I'm not going to push the pulpit over. But the point is that he was always pressing towards the mark. And he said, he said in verse 13, just one verse before, he says, I'm never going to be done with this task. He's like, I'm not done. I don't count it. He's like, I've done great things. But he's like, I count not myself to have apprehended. He's like, I'm going to keep pressing. You want to be driven, driven in your life? That's what you do. You keep pressing always. Yeah. You don't sit at work. You don't sit at home and be like, oh, you know, I've got, you know, nothing to do right now. And then you just like, because you can train yourself to be lazy as well. You can train yourself to be lazy just as much as you can train yourself to constantly be pressing. But you have to train yourself to be that way. Okay? Anybody can be driven. Anyone. Anyone. See, but here's what people do. Here's what, here's what the vast majority of people do in their lives. Here's what people do at work. Here's what people do in group situations. Here's what they do. They match the speed of the lowest, the slowest person. That's what you see. That's what you see in work environments. That's what you'll see in groups of people. Is that you know the slowest person is going 20 miles an hour, and everyone kind of just matches that comfort speed, and then that's what they do. No, you got to be the driven person that's constantly pressing, and then you'll be able to accomplish great things in your life. And especially, and look, guess what? If you're driven in your life, you'll be driven for Christ. I mean, isn't that what we see with Paul? Turn to Luke, chapter nine. Anybody can be driven, but it is learned behavior, folks. And how do you learn things? You just you do them again and again and again and again. You train yourself to constantly be pressing. Look, that will pay off for you in every part of your life. I guarantee it. Turn to Luke chapter 9. So you say, well, how about this? Let's look at the second one and apply it to our lives. Past sins. Paul was chief. Uh, of, of the sinners, I was chief. He said, you're like, ah, I got too many past sins. You know, I can't accomplish anything for Christ in my life. Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse number 59. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 59. Look what the Bible says here. Jesus is pretty big on, you know, what should stop you from serving him. Okay, he kind of lists things out. Like, here's the things, here's the things that are okay for you to not serve me. You know, and he kind of gives a, an, some examples here. Like, you know, you're like, I can't serve, I can't serve the Lord. And here's why. Well, let's see if it's on the list. Okay, look at verse number 59 of Luke chapter 9. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, so Jesus is going and he's saying to people, follow me. Follow me. I mean, what did he do to the, the first four fishermen? What did he do? He just said, let's go. And they just dropped their nets. And they followed him. But look what this guy says. He says, he says Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. I mean, that's pretty reasonable, right? <laughs> the guy's like, I mean, I'm assuming the guy's being literal here. The guy's like, uh, my dad just died. Let me just go, like, let me go put him in the ground, go to the funeral. I'll be right there. And Jesus is like, okay, no problem. Look what he says. Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. Ouch. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. The guy's like, the guy's like, I can't go to church. I got to, you know, my, my dad just died. I, I can't follow you. I can't go preach the gospel. I'll be there tomorrow. And Jesus is like, let the dead bury the dead. Let's get going. 
I mean, is that sheep Jesus? Is that long-haired hippie Jesus? I mean, that's, he's serious here. I mean, he's not messing around. And another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let, let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my house. I mean, that's pretty reasonable. He's like, let me go say goodbye to my mommy. And Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You know what Jesus said? Stay there. He's like, I want to go, go just say goodbye to my, my family. And Jesus is like, stay there. Is, is Jesus messing around here? He's telling us, he's telling us, you know, does he say, uh, does he say uh, what did you do uh, 10 years ago? No, he says, let's go. He says, let's go. Uh, look, this is Christianity 101, and this might be the thing that I preach the most. But here's what you need to understand. Anything that gets you out of church, anything that, especially you soul winners, you listen up. The Satan wants you to stop soul winning. We got people saved today. Satan doesn't want that. Satan doesn't want somebody opening a Bible and preaching the gospel to somebody and, and, and leading them from death to life. He will do anything to make that stop. He can't get your salvation from you. He can't take your salvation away. He can get you out of church, though. He can get you to stop soul winning, though. He can, look, anything that turns your heart and gets you to stop doing the first works is bad. This is not a 400-level Christianity course that I'm teaching you right now. This is Christianity 101. Anything that gets you out of church is bad. Anything that stops you from the first works is bad. Even going back to bury your father. Let the dead bury their dead. Because, I mean, these are dangerous situations. You get out of church, things slide downhill, your heart turns. Look, that kind of thing, if you allow it to happen, can curse you your whole life. And you will be the, you will be the opposite of somebody that does great things for the Lord in your life. Because, look, these men, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 15. These mighty men, these mighty men were not with David for five seconds. They were not with David for 30 days. They were not with David for six months. They were with David for a long time. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. They were loyal men. They were loyal men to David. Look at Ittai in 2 Samuel chapter 15 in verse number 19. Look, folks, you got to have some loyalty in your life or you're never going to have any friends. I'm not saying be blindly loyal to somebody who's in sin. I mean, that's stupid. But you got to have some loyalty in your life if you want to be consistent in your Christian life. Yeah. You can't be, just be somebody that's just like, one day I'm loyal, one day I'm not, one day you're my friend, one day I'm not. You'll, you'll never do anything in your life being unstable like that. These were loyal men, and that's why they were so successful. Look at verse number 19. This is Ittai the Gittite when uh, David's being ch chased out of his, his uh, kingdom by his own son. Then said the king to Ittai the Gittite, one of the guys that was following with him had just arrived. He just got there. And he wasn't even from, he wasn't even from the nation of Israel. He wasn't even from Judah. He said, then said the king to Ittai the Gittite, wherefore goest thou also with us? He's like, why are you coming with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also an exile. Whereas thou camest but yesterday, the guy just showed up. Should I this day make thee go up and down with us, seeing that I, that I go whither I may, return thou, and then back, and, uh, back thy brethren? Mercy and truth be with thee. And Ittai answered the king. He's saying, he's saying, why are you coming with us? You just got here yesterday. You're not even from here. He's like, you're a foreigner. This guy was a Philistine. He's like, why are you here? Why are you, why are you like involving yourself in this trouble? And Ittai's like, yeah, you're right. Because Ittai's like, this is the kind of guy Ittai was. He's like, I'm with you. Oh, it's going to be bad? Oh, I'm not with you. Oh, I'm with you. Oh, I'm not with you. Look what Ittai says. He says, and Ittai answered the king and said, as the Lord liveth. I mean, so he's like, as long as God's alive, which that means what? Forever, infinity, and as my Lord the king liveth, surely in what place my Lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. He's like, you know what? As long as God's alive, and you're alive, he's like, I'm with you, buddy. That's what he answers the king. This guy doesn't falter. He's a newcomer. He was a foreigner. He was a Philistine. Loyalty is an important trait. 
I mean, you will never have long-lasting friendships if you're not a loyal person. I mean, that's why I, I, I love the Red Hot. I love going to the Red Hot because like, I see friends that I've had friends for years and years and years and years and years there. Some of them will be there next year. Some of them I won't see until the, you know, three more Red Hots, but we'll see each other in three or four years and it'll be like we never missed a day. But that's, that's a great blessing in your life. So the point is, the past, the point, back to the point, the past, the past should not bring you down, it should motivate you. It should motivate you. How did it motivate Paul? It kept him humble. It kept him humble, and you know, here's the thing. Another thing you'll see is that like many times, people that have gone through bad things in their lives, they will many times be a great blessing to people because they went through those bad things. They will, they will notice, they will notice uh, dangers. They will notice dangers that other people will not notice. You'll notice this. I mean, I'll just, you know, a good example is just alcohol. Somebody that grew up with maybe that somebody, a parent or somebody that was an alcoholic, will be very in tune to the dangers of alcohol. Whereas if, you know, somebody that just never really grew up around that might fall into that sin easier. Hopefully, I preach enough about sin that everyone's scared to death about these types of sins here. But the point is, is that you can be, because of your past sins, going forward in your Christian life, you could be a great blessing. We've had that happen here, where people had bad things in their life, and they were just great blessings to other people because they had that wisdom and that knowledge and that, that understanding of, you know, wicked people in this world that would do certain wicked things, Okay. So here's the thing, your past should motivate you. Jesus says, don't even look back. It should never slow you down. Never. So here's the thing. Anyone can be great, folks. I, anyone, let me rephrase that. Anyone can do great things for Christ in their life. Anybody can be a powerhouse for Christ in their Christian life. You don't need fame. You don't need, look, you don't need money. You don't, look, you don't even need time. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Many people will say, many people will say, well, you know, I'm older. So um, I can't do as much in my Christian life because I'm an older person. You know Moses was 80 before he even went to Pharaoh? <laughs> he was 80 years old before he even went to Pharaoh to try to get the people out of Egypt. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 8. You don't even need time. You don't even have to tell yourself, ah, I'm too old to start over. Look, I got saved later in life. This could have been me. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 8. The Bible says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the, there it is again, proud in spirit. The Bible says, ending well is better. The Bible says, I mean, hey, at least you got to the truth. Now let's end well. If you were, I mean, this is what I'd tell to somebody that got saved when they were 98 years old. It's like, hey, let's end well. You know, because the ending's better. The Bible says it right there. Paul didn't just sit down and just lament his time as a Pharisee. He didn't, but you know what he didn't do? He didn't play down his sin either. He just said he used, he used that sin in his life, he used that past in his life to keep him humble. And by staying humble... And becoming a driven person, he was just a powerhouse for Christ. And any single person in this church can do the same thing. You stay humble. Use your past sins to keep you humble. Like, you know, look, look back at your life. Look back at your life and, and consider yourself the person that was forgiven 100,000. Consider yourself the person that was forgiven the 500 and not the one that was considered 50. Don't ever say to yourself, yeah, you know, but even when I was unsaved, I was pretty good. No, you were on your way to hell. Don't take your salvation for granted. Start there. That will keep you humble. And if you keep that humility and you become this driven person the Bible says you should become, you will do, look, I'm telling you, you will do great things for Christ in your life. You will do great things for this church. You will do great things for the kingdom of God. You will be a prophet. There will be scores of people in heaven because of you. Because of you going out and just, just preaching the gospel to people. It, that could be anybody. You too can do great things, just like Paul did. And, and you know what? 
for the exact same reasons. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.